Okay, so this is the um, implementing freeware tool for creating and publishing CAP alerts. And I'm going to present a simple software tool for doing that. Now, don't expect that this is the tool you would use in a production environment. It could be, but what I really prefer is that in your production environment, you use something you're already using, like, for example, a forecasting tool or whatever you're uh, already doing, that has CAP integrated in it. But in case you don't have that, and in any case, I think it's good to know, you can just do a standalone tool. So this is a standalone tool not integrated, although it would be best in a real environment to you have an integrated tool. So first, I'm going to start out by just walking you through an overview of your end state. What will it be like once you have it installed? This is what it looks like. I call it Cap Editor. The entry point is uh, this screen. And it opens up only if you have logged on with an ID or username password that confirms you are either a Cap Composer or an, a Cap com Approver. Okay, if you don't have the password for one or other of those, you don't get to get into the tool at all. Okay, so it gives you a challenge and you have to respond with the right password. At this point, we've got a weird shadow game going. At this point, you set the language you're going to be working in, because that really is true for the whole session. Also, whether it is a test or an actual or an exercise, a little pull-down box here, are you talking to just a restricted or single person, or are you talking to everybody? So that's the scope of it. And then, is this an original alert, or are you updating a prior alert? So figure out what you're doing, and then hit the Compose button. Next, you see this screen. And this lets you choose one of the draft alerts, because you're maybe not finished with it yet. You're still working on it. Or you could say, I want to start a new alert from a previously published alert. Okay. The reality in the world of emergency alerting is what you're alerting about has probably occurred before. <laughs> So there's something already set up that's going to be very similar. So then rather than give you a completely blank screen, you start from something you've already done. Whenever you uh, put the mouse over one of these entries, it broadens out so that you can see the actual description and instruction just to help you choose. And then these are the buttons to say, oh, that's the one I want. OK, so you click on one of the buttons. And then you get to the screen that lets you actually create a CAP alert. Remember I said CAP is just a business form. On a web browser, we call it a web form. When you signed up to reserve a hotel room, you filled out a web form. How many beds, you know, do you want breakfast? That's more complicated than this, because this doesn't require a Visa card, right? a credit card. So it's just a web form like you've all seen all over. So although they told you that you need IT background for this course, actually it's the same IT skills you need to just fill in a web form, which is, yeah, it's a browser for guys. I, I know how to do that. So anyway, it's very straightforward. Um, as you're working in this, if you put your, your uh, cursor over one of the entry fields, a little tooltip comes up, tells you what's valid for that. You see we have the standard pull down. Remember, we have coded values in CAP. The pull downs are for the coded values. We have some fields that are just straight text, so it's just a text input box. 
And of course, that text would be in whatever language you're, you're working in. So you'd put Spanish in the text boxes uh, if you're working in Spanish. At any point, you can choose to validate what you've got so far. OK? Uh, you could try to save it. It will not let you save the alert if it still has things that aren't valid. But it'll prompt you about what needs to be fixed. So you'll see that once you have it installed. You can also um, show the XML. See, it says show or hide the XML. So on the right side of the screen, when you click that button, you see the actual XML. Remember, CAP is XML, but you're using a web form to fill it out. So as soon as you've changed something in the form, as soon as you exit that field by putting your cursor somewhere else, you'll see this side change. So this side is linked to there. With its, it, those of you who know HTML, it's an on change event that just says, OK, update that because something's changed. You can at any time also use the mapping tool to show the alerting area. Here, my sample is Mount St. Helens volcano. And if you know where, what, what happens with weather systems over in that direction, the wind is mostly from that direction. So I, from the Mount St. Helens, I drew a circle 200 kilometers in diameter to show the alerting area for that event. Now here's what happens when you hit the validate button. So now the XML display side is showing the results from the Google Cap Validator. We just launched the Google Cap Validator in this window. And of course, it shows you the XML and it shows you it's valid. And if you scroll down, you see it on a map as Google would show it to Google users. At any point, as I said, you can save it. And if it's valid, it gets saved. And this is the message you get uh, telling you that the draft alert has been saved. So it puts what you've been working on into the directory called drafts. Now, drafts is fine. <laughs> but what you really want, if you're an approver, is you want to publish the alert. So that's what this button's about. Only if you are valid or authenticated at, in the role of approver, you will see this button. If you sign on as composer, which does not have approval authority, the button won't even show there. But if you see the button, you push it, and all that happens is that your draft alert gets copied to the alerts directory because now it's real, and an item gets inserted as the first item in the feed, right? Because it's in most recent first. So here's the one we were just working on, Mount St. Helens. It's the first one. OK? That's all there is to it. It's essentially a web form. Start out with, I don't want to give you a blank form, so tell me what you want to start from. And at the end, OK, you're done. You're happy with it, and it's valid. Go ahead and publish. It's a pretty easy little workflow. What are the components required for deploying that? Those of you who aren't techie, you can space out here for this slide. Those who have some technology background, I'll explain what it's doing. The Cap Editor tool presents a web user interface, of course, you know that. The user view is implemented with JSP, Java Server Pages. Uh, and that's what makes the HTML form. The editing is done with embedded client-side JavaScript. Why is that important? Because it means you've got the source. You can make it be whatever you want. You say, hey, your form is too complicated, Elliot. I don't need all those optional fields. Well, fine, take them out or hide them. OK. You want something else? Make it so. You want different tool tips? Different colors, make it flash. Whatever you, whatever you want to do, you can, because it's, it's your JavaScript right there. When you publish the alert, in other words, when we put it in the alerts directory, 
All we're doing is putting it in the file system as a file. There's no database. There's no SQL, none of that. It's the file system, the pieces within the file we get with XPath in XML, that's it. So everything in the JavaScript is really all you need to see. The tool runs on Apache Tomcat. Now in the real world environment, in the server you're likely to put this up on, I'd say there's maybe a 10% chance that Tomcat is their platform of choice. It's unusual. The reason I do it in the classroom is it's easy to set up because otherwise you have to set up the whole Apache system, which is complicated, and a language like PHP, which itself is also complicated, or you'd have to set up Microsoft Server, or there's just too many complications. In the classroom, this works real well. When you are ready for the real world, talk to me. There's a version that you can run that is very likely the one you're running in the real world. And that's for either Microsoft or Linux. OK, I'm also installing on local host. Local host, what the heck is that? Local host is a special version of the internet which runs in a self-contained environment inside your PC. OK, local host means do not use the domain name service to resolve a host name because this host name is localhost, okay? So it's not like, you know, um, www.usgs.gov. It's just localhost. That's the host name. Okay, that is the full internet, but if you're, in fact, not connected to the internet, this still runs because it's not using the public internet. It's using the internet that's already in your PC. You have the full internet stack always in your PC anyway. So, everybody re-engage <laughs> if, if you were zoned out for that last slide because it was too, too deep on the techie side. All of you need to know that we are going to put in the CAP editor application, which uses Tomcat, but Tomcat uses Java. So because Tomcat required Java compiler anyway, I wrote Cap Editor in Java. So you don't need any other language than what you already have to do Tomcat. So looking bottom up at the base, we've got to have the Java compiler, and that's not the Java runtime. It's something I'm going to give you. Then you have to have Tomcat. And we've installed both of those. Then we start thinking about Cap. All we're doing in these two steps is turning you into a web server, a web host on the internet, which is damn dramatic, actually. <laughs> That's a really big deal. You now have the ability to publish things to the whole world. Okay, We're going to take you to there because your PC is normally not doing that. But we're going to make you a host on the internet, local host, so don't think we're actually publishing to the whole world. But it, it could be if you install it in a, um, a domain other than localhost. And then we drop in the cap editor, and that's where I re-engage with the Apple people who already have Tomcat uh, installed elsewhere. So to get there, we're going to start with giving you, well, I'll just walk them around, giving you everything you need on this USB stick. What I want you to do when you get the USB stick, just like he's doing right now, Plug it in, copy the CAP Jumpstart Ecuador. We're pretending you're all from Ecuador, because I needed a sample. <laughs> He's going to install CAP Jumpstart Ecuador by simply copying the USB stick to his C drive. Just right at the root of the C drive, just copy it. Then remove the USB stick. And the reason I say to remove the USB stick is some people get all the way through the install, and then I find out. It's not where I thought it was. Well, right, because you installed from the USB stick instead of the C drive. <laughs> so just copy it over to the C drive. Each machine that's installing. But okay. Uh, sorry. If I use, I don't have C drive. 
If you oh, you're on Linux, yeah. So put it in uh, HT. Look for your uh, document root. Yeah. Okay, put it there. Okay. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. If you just pass these out to everybody who's doing the install, um, are you sitting next to somebody who's doing the install? Are you going to? Sorry, you working with her? Okay, I need you to sit next to her then. Or maybe I should ask it the other way. I need him to sit next to you. If that's all right with you. Okay. While she's passing that out, let me just give you a little bit of background. Java. This is step one in your install. First thing we need to do in order to make you a web host. Java comes in two versions, for 32-bit and for 64-bit. Is that everybody? Does anybody still need one? OK. Is there anybody who doesn't know whether they have a 32-bit or a 64-bit computer? Raise your hand. OK. I think you're all 64. Is anybody 32? OK. Don't worry about that explanation then about how to find out whether you're 32 or 64. So what you're going to do is go to your C drive. And remember, remove now the USB stick once your copy is finished. Go to your C drive. Go to cap, jump, start, Java. And in that directory, find the appropriate exe executable file for your machine. If you are 64, and I think you all are, it ends in x64. On your machine, in your file system, you might be hiding file extensions. That's a bad idea, <laughs> because there are exploits that will trick you into clicking on a virus, because you couldn't see that it's actually an executable. But at any rate, just look for the thing that has 64 in it. I want you to right click and do install as administrator. OK, you're going under the C, cap jumpstart, Ecuador. C, C, cap jumpstart, Ecuador. OK, I want you to go to Java. OK, and look for the one that has x64. Right click. Pull down to run as administrator. OK, why are we running as administrator and not just clicking on it? Because everything on your machine wants to be able to execute this. You might think, I'm the only user on my machine. No. When an application is running, the operating system sees it as a different user. OK, so you, you, you need permission for cap editor to run as well as you yourself to run when you sign in. But at any rate, the trick is you just need to run as administrator. So do that. Then wait for it. Do not think, oh, nothing's happening. I, maybe I'll click again. Now you're going to install it on top of itself. For some reason, it takes quite a while for the um, Java to start giving you the little you know, hourglass that's spinning or the spinning circle or whatever. And I think the reason is it's checking your whole disk to see if there's other Java already out there. So it takes a while. Just wait for it. Don't, don't click it thinking that you haven't done it yet. OK, at that point, it will start installing. You simply accept every default. Typically, you just click the Next button. And when it's all done, you'll get a little message from Oracle inviting you to share your contact information with them. You don't want to do that. Java is free. You don't have any requirement to Oracle to give them any information whatsoever so they can market to you. Just close it at that point, and you're fine. OK, so I am going to come around, and I'm going to look for your screen that's saying uh, Java is installing, and then when it's all done, we'll go on to step two. So I'm going to be just looking over your shoulder, to see, or it might be just going slow. So those of you who are done, we're going ready for step two. And let me also point out these steps 
I'm referring to are the same steps in the readme.doc that you find under cap editor. So there's a readme that in just a few pages does everything I'm doing with these verbose PowerPoint slides. So that's what you would typically follow. Okay, so just readme.doc walks you through the install. Those steps are the same as these steps. This is just more wordy. Now it says to check if Tomcat is already installed. Some of you already have Tomcat and you know that. The rest of you don't worry about it. <laughs> We're going to install Tomcat if you need to. And you do that by going to the Tomcat directory back in C, Cap Jumpstart Ecuador, subdirectory Tomcat. There's only one exe file and it's called Let's call this Tomcat. At any rate, <laughs> right click on that. Again, run as administrator and let it roll. Accept all the defaults. When it says configuration, it'll prompt you, do you want to use the Java runtime environment that it's pointing to? And the answer is yes, that's the one that you just installed when you put it in Java. So anyway, again, just accept all the defaults, walk on through. At the end, click Finish, and you'll be good. So I want to see you go ahead and finish that. And once you see Finish, you're going to enter this URL, HTTP, not HTTPS, just HTTP, colon, slash, slash. You should know, sidebar, HTTP is a scheme in URLs. There's other schemes like NNTP, HTTPS, mail, etc. Scheme. Then you always have a colon. Then whenever you see two slashes, that means the next thing is a host name. Our host name is localhost. Then there's a colon. And then you normally run on what's called the well-known port. Port is just a computer science term for an address in memory. It's an address in memory where a piece of software is looking for data to show up. Okay. The well-known port for HTTP is 80. And you could also use any other port. And if it's greater than 1,000, you're specifically saying to the world and to your computer that this is for testing only. So by default, Tomcat comes up in port 8080. And so just put that in. So you're going HTTP colon slash slash host name is localhost port is 8080. When you enter that, you'll see a screen that looks like this. OK? So that's all we're trying to do is get you to this screen. That means you have successfully become a host on the internet. However, <laughs> for two reasons, you're not really going to scare the bejesus out of people with false alerts. One is because you're on local host. So nobody in the rest of the world can even see you. Also, you're on 8080, which is a testing port not a real port, so nobody would think to look there um, unless you told them to, that you've got a um, thing running. All right, so I want you to just install Tomcat, which remember is simply go to your Tomcat directory in the Cap Start Ecuador, right click, run as administrator, accept all defaults, hit click when, or click finish when you're done, and then go to this host and that'll show that you've got a web host. So I'm going to come around and see if you bought that. Some of you already have. I know that. OK. So this was Lyndon's question. How do you start and stop Tomcat? Or more generally, how do you tell if it's running? So one way is, OK, in the lower right corner of your, what do they call that, the home page? The 
the desktop, the lower right corner of the desktop. Why do you have windows in a desktop? I mean, at any rate, <laughs> you have these little uh, quick launch icons. And if you pull up on there, you'll see this one. That might be hard for you to see, but let me describe it. It's a red feather with a little forward button on it. That's Apache Tomcat. Sidebar, do you know why Apache is called Apache? It's got nothing to do with the Apache Indian tribe or Indian nation. It's because when the HTTP was first invented, the folks who developed it gave out a really um, broken version of that HTTP daemon, which is the thing that sits at port 80 and listens for incoming stuff. It was a mess. It really did not work well. So folks at Stanford University Networking, which became Sun Microsystems, got together and fixed it with a bunch of patches. Their version was called a patchy version of HTTP daemon. So he said, ah, Apache. It sounds like Apache. So let's call it Apache. So at any rate, that's why it's got an Indian feather. You can click on that. And when you do, you see this dialog. This dialog tells you the status. In this case, I'm showing Tomcat has already started. Because it started, my only option is to stop it. If this was stopped, then my option would be to start it. OK, so you can get to this dialog by just clicking on the Apache icon. More generally, any service that's running anywhere on your computer is among the services. So to get there, just go to your little start thing on your uh, desktop and start typing services. You'll see something with a little gears, these little gears it's called services. And when you click that, you see all the services that are running, or all the services that have, have been defined, some of which are running and some are not. And you see one of them should be Apache Tomcat. And when I put my cursor on there so it's highlighted, I get the option to stop it. See, because the status is started, I get the option to stop it and to restart it. Restart is just do a stop, and then once it's stopped, automatically do a start. OK, over here, we don't have a restart. We have to stop it and then start it. But in the services, it actually gives you a restart. OK? So that's how, and you're going to have to do this later, because we're going to have to restart Tomcat, and I'll show you why in a minute. But this is how you control your web host on the internet. Now let me point out something that's really important to understand. What you've just now done is bring up a host on the internet. This is not your normal job. As a meteorologist, it's not your job as a forecaster. It's probably not ever your job, except possibly one or two of you in this room. This is what the system administrator does. And you have one. You may not know who it is. In fact, it may be contracted out to an ISP, Internet Service Provider. So you've just done the work they would normally do. OK, that's just so we can do in the classroom what in the real world would be done by somebody else. But you've just acted as the administrator, and now you're managing a whole web environment which has just one user, or just one application, but still, it's a whole web host. OK. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, I'll come, I'll come there in a second. Let me get everybody else on to the next step, and then I'll come catch you up. OK, so the next step is we're going to deal with who are the authorized editors. I'm going to give you how to get the sample alert so you have things to start from. I'll show you the RSS file. Remember, we have a feed that we're setting up, so we have a starter set for your RSS file. I give you a style sheet 
so that your cap alerts look pretty <laughs> to end users. And then we'll, uh, and then we'll actually do the install of cap editor. So this is step three. The first thing is to go ahead and define at least one user, and we're going to do just one, who is a composer. So his role is composer, and at least one, and we're going to do exactly one, who is an approver. The name, username for the composer is set up as composer at email.com. I made that up. It's not a real email system. There is no email system called email.com. I made the password for that fake user test, which is a terrible password, I know. And here we show the role as the composer. What I want you to do when we bring it up is I want you to log on as an approver so that you actually get the publish button. His name is approver at email.com. His password is secret. Very clever password, right? It's a secret password. <laughs> At any rate, so the password is secret. In the real world, you would, of course, use a really decent uh, password, not this. So we need this file to be given to Tomcat so that Tomcat knows the users we intend to have in Tomcat. Right now, you've got a generic Tomcat right out of the box. It doesn't know anything about CAP. It doesn't know about these users. So we're going to tell it about that. How do we do it? We take this file which is right here. If you go to C, Program Files, Apache Software Foundation, this is a URL from hell, right? Apache Software Foundation, Tomcat 8.5, Cont for configuration, there is a file that is tomcatusers.xml. We're going to replace that because you're going to go to your C cap jump start Ecuador under Tomcat. Take the file that is tomcatusers.xml and just drag that or copy and paste to this location. So all the stuff I just explained in reality is just you're going to copy a file from one place to the other. Okay. Having done that, Tomcat now has a new sense of who the valid users are. And in order for him to deal with that, you're going to have to stop Tomcat and restart it, because he learns his users during startup. OK, so copy a file and then restart Tomcat. OK, I'm going to come around. And first, I'm going to start with you. <laughs> Well, the last thing we're going to do is actually install the cap editor, and we'll just leave the customizations in place. So to actually install it, again, it is you're just going to copy a file from one place to the other. OK? You're copying the file from cap editor, which is under cap jumpstart Ecuador, C drive, cap jumpstart Ecuador, cap editor, and go get the file that ends in WAR. And if you're not showing extensions, it's org.cap.editor.en or es, depending on the language, .jsp. Right? And bring that thing over and drop it into C, Program Files, Apache Software Foundation, Tomcat 8.5 web apps. Or in the case of Peru, this will be at Archivos de Program, right? Programs. OK, so that's all, all everything I just talked about boils down to copy this file from here to web apps. Web apps is a directory that Tomcat continuously monitors to see new applications that want to be installed. Tomcat loves to install applications. That's what it lives for. Nothing makes Tomcat happier than installing another application. 
as soon as he sees, oh, look, a war file, ooh, he will deploy it. What does deploy mean? It's essentially unzip. A war file is a zip file. Well, why don't they call it a zip file? Well, because if they called it a zip file, you would be inclined to unzip it. They don't want you to unzip it, so they renamed it from zip to war, <laughs> which stands for web archive. It's got nothing to do with armed conflict. The WAR, web archive file, you just put that web archive file in there, Tomcat will unzip it, which means you'll now see a directory with org.cap.editor.en.jsp, and you're running. Now, you may have to restart Tomcat, but I don't think so. If, if, you, if you have a problem and can't get to this address, we'll restart it. But as soon as you put it in the web apps, Tomcat starts it for you, and then you'll have this place you can go to. Okay, you can also just go to the local host 8080, use the manager, and come in, and you'll see it running, and then you can right click, open a new window. All right, so go ahead and do that. Copy that file from the cap jump start cap editor, copy the war file, and paste it under Apache Tomcat at the web apps directory. And then just wait, and you'll see the magic happen. Okay? So I'm going to walk around and see if that's all working for you. Right, so you all entered this, approver at email.com with the password of secret. And I entered it wrong. <laughs> ah. At any rate, let me show you what this looks like. I'm going I'm to go into the other version of it here, just a sec. So you just choose any one, right? Now let me show you a little bit about how OpenStreetMap works. So um, ignore the fact that I happen to be situated over Fiji because that's the last one that I installed here. In your case, you're, you're over Ecuador. But to do a polygon, just hit the polygon. Then you click and move across. Actually, I'll go this way. Down, 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 back up. Now as soon as I do that, you see the message that came up? It says, can I have your attention, please? Yeah. OK. So it's saying the vertex order is changed to counterclockwise. Who knows why that's happening? Mm -hmm. <laughs> OK. So it turns out in geographic information systems that when you want to enclose an area with a polygon, you do it by going counterclockwise around. If I left this as clockwise, which is the way I drew it, I'm actually saying everywhere in the world except this. Why does GIS work that way? Well, because you sometimes need to do that. Let's imagine you have a chemical spill. You want the people right nearby, people within a city block, to evacuate. The next group, you want them to shelter in place. Just stay inside your houses and keep your windows and doors closed, right? How do you show that? So it's two concentric circles. But if you just draw two concentric circles and say, alert these people, the people on the inside circle get both alerts. Evacuate, stay inside, evacuate, stay inside. What? What you really wanted was a circle for evacuate 
and a donut. An empty circle, right? Just this ring of, for people who need to shelter in place. Now, in the real world, too many of our systems are not GIS. Google Map is not a GIS. It is a mapping display tool, and it is stupid. It does not correctly handle an inner and an outer ring uh, by the clockwise direction, which is what the standard requires. How does Google get around that? Google never lets you specify an area larger than a hemisphere. For the most part, that's not a bad strategy, but in a real GIS, it's backwards. If you put out a tsunami alert for Fiji and you draw it backwards, and, and in this case, we're correcting it, but if it went out uncorrected, it's perfectly valid to say you've warned everybody in the world except for the people who are in the threat of that tsunami. <sighs> exactly what you don't want to do. So what we do with the tool is if you draw it wrong because you went clockwise, we'll just change the order to counterclockwise because we assume that's what you really meant. <laughs> but we also tell you we're changing it, which is why I got this message. So having done that, here's my polygon. Now I can go in and edit the polygon, and as soon as I click on this little edit button, you see that I can say, oh yeah, well, I, I wanted to enclose that little bit here, and actually that's further away than I wanted to be. I say, okay, now I'm happy, so you save it. Okay? So that's how the tool works. You can go and um, just highlight that one and delete it, right? Clear all. Um, I could also do a circle. See how I just clicked, and then as soon as that click is registered, which is the center of the circle, I can make the radius whatever I want. Having changed it, or having made that radius, I can then say, actually, I want to move that so it's more centered. So I just move it. And then when I do save, that's my new circle. So I could do a circle and a polygon. I could do just a circle, or I could do just a polygon. Do whatever you like. Uh, make it look nice. In this particular interface, we do not let you draw a bunch of different polygons for two reasons. One, it's a much more confusing user interface if you have multiples going, but also because I would strongly recommend that you not issue one alert with multiple alerting areas. Why? Because when you go to update it, for example, you have a moving storm, and there's a bunch of areas here, and some are now all clear because the storm has moved on. These still have the same situation, and other ones are coming on. It's horrendous to try to figure out how to mix and match which pieces are turning on and turning off. Do a separate alert for the people in your alerting area. CAP is oriented not to the event, which might be, well, I'm just going to do a CAP alert for the storm that's moving. No. You do an alert for people who are in a place who need to be alerted. So for them, being in one place means, oh, we're being warned. Oh, it's happening. Oh, it's all clear. That's your evolution. The fact that the storm is moving over is a whole other area. It's a whole other kind of uh, emergent property of a set of alerts. What you want to do is just do an area and say, here's what those people need to know. The same storm, I've got another area. They need to know something slightly different. It's going to be longer before it gets there. They might go all clear. It might miss them entirely. Just think of, remember, think of CAP as oriented around an alerting area because the root of a CAP alert is alert. It's not event. We are not doing event mapping. We are doing alert mapping. OK, enough of lecture. <laughs> when you have this the way you want it, you then just go and, and save it. Well, let me say you try to save it. So let me see what happens when I do save. I've got another error. It's validating for me. It says a value for restriction is mandatory when the scope is restricted. Well, OK, what's that about? So it has now moved my cursor to the value that's wrong. See how the scope says restricted? 
And yet, we never said, oh, we never said, what's the restriction? So I should put in something like civic authorities, uh, uh, civic if I could spell. Okay, that has no meaning unless somebody is doing um, email list or whatever that says here's the addresses that that expands into. CAP just says we give you the ability to say a restriction. You'd have to write other software that would expand that into what does that mean in my local situation. Or another way to fix it on this particular alert is that, oh, actually, I meant that to be public. See, as soon as I change it to public, the element called restricted goes away, because when it's public, there is no restriction. Same thing as if I said it was private, in which case it says, OK, you said it's private, so show me the email addresses that are supposed to be for this private alert. In any case, once I fixed it, I try again to save it. Now it successfully saves. OK, so all it's done is copy it from the drafts over to the alerts. Let me finish. <clears throat> and then I would publish it. That's it. The RSS feed has now been updated. But that particular URL is fake because we're just doing local host. So that's not the real one. But that's how it would work. OK, so that's everything in it. Go ahead and start playing with that. If you're having any problems, have me come over there, and we'll get you fixed up. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. It's a comma-separated field, I believe. Yeah. Sí, como un campo separado. Comma space or comma. I think it's just a comma. Next, next. Yeah, yeah, yeah. 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 Space. yeah. Now in this in in your and we pointed to a oh we didn't hear, but let me go ahead and do this. We say, well, we've got a picture over there and it's called, you know, pick dot jpeg. JPG. And I'm gonna try to save that. says, when the image URI is not blank, the MIME type is required and must start with an RFC 2046 top level media type. Hmm. What is that? And it says, oh, like image slash JPEG. Oh, yeah, that's what I need. OK, so that's the message you'll get if you put in a pointer to something, but didn't specify the MIME type. In CAP 1.1, that was not required. It was an optional field. In CAP 1.2, it is required. Because too often in real deployed CAP systems, people were trying to get it and say, I don't know what this is. I'm guessing it's a video, but it's not a real video. It's an RM, which is a, don't make the system guess give us the image, uh, or give us the, the MIME type. So you, you, you have to give it a MIME type. Uh, it's typically not a big deal. You probably know right away what the MIME type is. But it's particularly for those, uh, those funny ones. There are several hundred, I think there's actually thousands of different MIME types. So anyway, but they all start with just a few top level things, like image or video or whatever. OK, any other questions? OK, all except for Peru, where we're going to fix the problem we fixed last time I was in Peru. <laughs> you've all got the thing working. So you've got a toy to play with. And let me finish off this presentation. By talking about. Uh, talking about what you can do next. So, when, anytime, yep. 
any time that you're using the application, you can, we already just had this discussion, you can add new cap alerts. You say, ooh, I just saw a cap alert from Columbia. Did things just the way I'd like to do because we're doing the same kind of thing. Just copy their alert. Stick it in your drafts directory. Now it's a pick that you can say, okay, I'll start with what they had. Okay? There is no database. So nothing gets screwed up. Whatever's in the drafts directory is what you're prompted to start with. Now you might say, well, actually they were using some other system and they've got things in their cap alert that we don't use. Not a problem. When the software initializes your page with the pieces, it picks out the pieces we know. If there's stuff we don't know about, we won't use it. If there's stuff that they're missing that you have a field for, it'll be blank. So it doesn't hurt anything. Mix and match. Use cap alerts where you see them. Use good examples. Um, and, and when you get into the world of IBF, I think there's going to be a whole lot of let's share this well-known phrasing that's worked before. This is something that social science research has told us people actually understand. You know, like shelter in place. Mm, wrong. People don't know what that means. They don't. I mean, we've been using the term, and you go and study people, and they're like, I was running down the street, you know, trying to find that shelter in place I was supposed to go to. No, that meant stay at home. We just, yeah. At any rate, reuse other people's text. It's not cheating. <laughs> it's not plagiarism. Use common things that real people know. Again, during an emergency, they don't have a lot of bandwidth. There's this tunnel vision that locks in. You want a few well-chosen phrases, you know, uh, cover, drop, run, or whatever, you know, that's for earthquake. Very simple phrasing. Reuse that as much as possible. So when you see a good cap alert, just bring it in and use it. You can, um, you can customize that template. You see on your um, screen the little click to go out and pull off headline description and instruction. Okay, it's, it's, in the, it's on the screen that says templates. You can make that whatever you want. Make those work well for you. The ones we have right at, now, at the moment are the ones we used in the Caribbean. Um, so we have them in Dutch and Spanish and French and English and Papiamento. So you can use them for the Dutch. But he may well find, you know, we never have terrorist alerts in Suriname. What we do have are oil spills. OK, we'll make one for oil spills. And you'll see it's just HTML tables. So just have your, have your HTML programmer um, extend it. And here's where you can go to see those uh, templates as they already stand. If you want to support a language other than English, uh, first of all, during your first setup screen, you said you can put whatever language you want in there. And then you can just enter Spanish text or whatever. Further, if you want the user interface to be Spanish, because you're seeing like the forecaster who's composing the alert is Spanish speaking. Good idea. Make it Spanish. And you do that by just changing, see where it says cap E-N? Make it E-S. As soon as you change that to E-S, there is a translation file that will change it to Spanish. There's one for Dutch. Um, I have one now for Shona, <laughs> if you're in Zimbabwe. Um, we have French, we have French, Spanish, Dutch, and I think that's all at the moment. Uh, but if you want that in Arabic or Chinese, whatever, there's just a thousand words, which are all these little prompts, like vertex order change to counterclockwise. Those little prompts, you just translate what's in the temp, the translation file, and you can make it any language you want. In your case, the Spanish is probably going to work just fine for you. OK. In the real world, you are probably going to discover that you talk to your ISP or your system administrator, and he says, Tomcat? We don't run Tomcat. We run full Apache. And frankly, in Apache, we rather you did PHP very common. It's called what they call a LAMP server or a WAMP server. LAMP is Linux, Apache, MySQL, which we don't use, and PHP or Python. 
Uh, so there is a PHP version. So in your real world, if you want to put this up and your system administrator says, I don't know from Tomcat, you got PHP, you say, yes, we've got that. It's much smaller. It's actually simpler in many ways. Um, at any rate, if you want that, come see me and I'll uh, send it to you, or you can just go here and try the install yourself. Uh, that also runs on plain old Microsoft. So if you have Microsoft Server or whatever. Now the other trick about it is we did the Tomcat users.xml, remember to do approver and composer. In your real world back home, who knows what they did for role-based access. Most of you will go home and find out, oh, they run something called Active Directory. That's fine, we support that. Um, the other one is, well, we don't have any particular tool, but we just use the Apache file system thing for roles, and this uh, walks you through that as well. So I think your role-based access is going to be fine. Uh, try it, call me if you've got some other oddball that I've never heard of, and we'll help you walk through getting that uh, up and running. But it, it's pretty straightforward. It's just, there's a lot of variation out there on, on web hosts. Okay, so the key points that we've covered in this CAP 204. Uh, I walked you through what the example tool looks like for creating alerts in CAP format. We talked about the components. What are the components? First, there's two components that have nothing to do with CAP itself. They're just bringing up a host on the internet. That was the Java compiler plus Tomcat web container. That gets you a host. Once you have that, you just drop in the cap editor and you're up and running. Okay, so that's the three components, two of which are just to get a web host and then the other one is on top. The local configuration, again, you're gonna go back home and you know, find your logo. <laughs> you're gonna decide what do you wanna put for your RSS file for the little text thing that says latest alerts from IDM or whatever, and the same thing for your um, uh, style sheet to make that be just the way you want it. Um, also, you will see in the style sheet that it says very clearly where you add in the header. So Bureau of Meteorology has a standard header for, I, I'm picking on you, but I know it's the same for everybody. You've got the look and feel police. <laughs> You've got to have this header. You've got to have this footer. Fine, it's just code you just stick in. It shows right where to put it in. Then they all, your cap alerts look like the rest of the stuff from Bureau of Meteorology. You have the legal disclaimers that you need to have and all that stuff. So that's, that's all straightforward. That's just uh, customizing your RSS file. Okay, all the local configurations. Um, we walked through already about how to change where the map starts out and at what zoom level. Oh, I don't think I mentioned the zoom levels. The zoom levels, um, I think I started you at an eight, uh, which is the right size sort of for uh, Ecuador. Um, I, I did this for the uh, Federated States of Micronesia. Their zoom level is three. Because <laughs> it's like 3,000 miles across from one island to the other. It's all open water, <laughs> it ain't much land, but it is a huge area. So you, you zoom in or out, the, the tightest you can go if you're not in an intelligence agency, is 14, which is about a meter. Actually, the tightest you can go is two meters if you're over Israel. <laughs> Everywhere else, it, you can go all the way down to a meter. If you're in an intelligence agency, it keeps on going. So they can go down to inches and less. Uh, I don't know that we need that in our public alerting. We do have places to do public alerting at the meter scale. Uh, but that's the, that's the things about Zoom. Okay, otherwise, I think you're done. You're equipped to go back home and talk to your system admin, say, oh, I saw this cool thing, and I want to install software on your web host, and they'll go like, you want a what? <laughs> that's okay. Walk them through it, or you know, have them call me, and I'll, I'll, I'll work with you to help them uh, understand what you're trying to do. Uh, the big thing for them is going to be, where are you putting the files? The drafts and the alerts, in other words, the real data and the stuff you don't want the public to see, need to be private for the drafts, public for the stuff for the public. Now, how do you do that? Your system admin will tell you. You can't tell them how to do it. They'll tell you how they require you to do it. 
That's why we have two different configurations as to where you put them. They might actually say, and I know this is true in much of the government where I work, nothing that is private can be on the same machine as the public stuff. There's what we call an air gap. They're physically different machines. Fine. We just put them in two different places. It'll, the system will still move stuff back and forth uh, through the configuration file to that. So basically, I'm saying whatever constraints you run into, we probably have a solution because we've seen it before, and we can get stuff running for you pretty straightforwardly. Um, in most cases, you'll find once you say, well, I've got a PHP version, they'll say, ah, that's the one we want. <laughs> and they'll just go ahead and say, give me the Linux version with PHP, and we'll just put it up. Even ISPs. And so in other words, some people may find we don't actually run our own servers. We've contracted that out, and this company lets us install stuff, but only on the one place they tell us we can install it. Fine. It's almost certainly a LAMP server, and they'll take the PHP and be happy. OK? So that's everything you needed to know in terms of installing this. All right, so I want to shut this down at this point. And unless there are any questions about that, I want to shift entirely to a completely different discussion. And to recap, we started out this morning, you not knowing what CAP is, and now you know. I think you started out saying, I'm not sure I even want to do CAP. Uh, hopefully, you're now saying, well, I'd like to do CAP <laughs> in our agency. And now you know what the content is of a CAP message. You know what it means to be a cap feed. And as soon as you've taken that step of having a cap feed, Google, the Red Cross, AccuWeather, Weather Company, all these other things, digital billboards, can pick up your alerts and disseminate for you without you doing a thing. You simply post it on your feed. Everything else is magic. Just like if you want to be on the internet, right? You just put up a web host and then web crawlers like Google come and find your stuff and tell it. Sometimes even if you don't want them to find your stuff, they find your stuff and they tell. It's the same idea. We make your stuff just get out there. So that's why you want to use CAP, because it leverages all these other infrastructure things. So you know what CAP is, why you want to do it, you know how to do it, and now you've actually done it on a very local internet, which is no bigger than your own machine. So what's the next question? Hmm, what am I going to do in Guyana? What am I going to do in Argentina? What am I going to do in Peru? What am I going to do back home with what I've now learned to take it to the next step? Normally what I do um, when I do what's called a cap jumpstart, and you saw it day one of a cap jumpstart just now, is on day two, I kind of fade into the background and somebody from that country leads a discussion about, OK, what are we going to do next? In some cases, it's in Guyana. It was, let's set up a server and have it running. And I think a day later, we got there. It was up and running. We had a dozen different agencies or whatever already up and running. I did another one in, uh, um, in a way. Do you know that in, uh, in a way? It's the world's smallest country. 1,500 people. No, no, no. No, no, no. This is a small island. I-N-U-E, in a way. Right. It's a, it's a tiny island. It used to belong to New Zealand back in the 1970s. At any rate, there's only 1,500 people. Their end was, nah, this is all good. We like it. But we're really going to need clearance from the top levels of our government. I'm like, oh my God, because I'm thinking like United States. They said, oh, oh, but it's okay because the minister is right there. <laughs> I was like, oh, nice to be in a small country. So they wanted to do the policy level next. But what I want to do right here with us now is let's start talking it through. Think about what is it that you would do back home? Do you need a policy clearance to take it to the next step? Do you need to say, actually, our emergency management agency is the kingpin for our country, so we got to get them on board. Okay, or you may say, well, this, this happened in uh, um, Belize. They said, 
We're in the Port Authority, and although we can't get a national system going, we just want to do alerts for when a ship gets stuck in the channel to tell other boats not to come through. So they're going to do their own alerting just from the harbor master using CAP. Perfectly legitimate. They're not going to wait for the national clearance to do a national level alert when they have an issue in their port. Fine. Okay, so you can mix and match it. Same way in, in Barbados. The Barbados bus company is implementing CAP, and they're going to do it privately so that their bus driver can call in when he says, sees that there's a flood on his regular route. Tell the other drivers, tell the passengers they're going to have delays. You can mix and match at any level. Do not make the mistake of saying, well, I can't do anything until we've got everybody lined up at some giant meeting with all stakeholders. You're just never going to get that done. Take the people who've got energy, excitement, let them run with it, and then that'll catch fire. The other people will say, oh, well, it may catch fire. New South Wales ran with it a while ago, and maybe Australia is still coming. But let's talk about it. Let me, let me just go around the room and have you say a little bit from each of you about what do you see doing with this. And if you're from, like Columbia already has, a cap feed going from UNGRD, but not yet from IDM. So I'm just going to have you pass this around and tell me what you want to do and share ideas with each other about how you think this is going to work out. Oh, Spanish is fine. Let me get my thing so I can hear too. <laughs> 